Hello, dear friends. We thank you for joining us here in the study of the Sabbath School uh, here at Sam TV. We are delighted that you can join us in the study of today's or this week's lesson. We're actually in the book of Mark and we're studying the lesson number six titled Inside Out. And so we have a wonderful study today and we pray that you will be blessed as we open God's word, as we discuss the lesson and the details and the thoughts that we want the Holy Spirit to help us convey to you so you may receive a blessing. I have the privilege to have uh, two distinguished guests and friends here in the ministry. To my right, Diana Harris. Thank you for coming, Diana. What a blessing mm -hmm. to have you here. Good to be here. Praise the Lord. And we want to hear your input as well <laughs> as Brother Melvin Blue, our uh, elder here in the church, in the local church, but also one of those individuals who brings always joy to, to our ministry. Thank you for coming, Melvin. It's, it's my joy to participate on this panel, especially being in this seat. Praise the Lord, <laughs> I know. And so we are delighted. And so before we start in this lesson that deals with these issues that are, you know, speaking of what's more important, the inward or the outward, we are going to seek the Lord in prayer. So I'm going to ask Brother Melvin if you could please pray for us. And uh, Diana, you can read for us also the memory text afterwards so that we can get into the lesson, right? All right, let's bow our heads. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to come today uh, and to study your word. And we ask, Father, as we open your word, that you would open our eyes so that we can see clearly and plainly what you have on the printed page for us. We ask, Father, that as you open our eyes, that you would also open our ears mm -hmm. so that uh, we can hear even the still small voice that says, this is the way, walk ye in it. Amen. And then after our eyes and our ears are open, we ask you to open our hearts so that we not only see and hear, but so that we can receive the truth. And in receiving it, it can take root, germinate, and spring up to new life, recreating us in the image of the Christ. Because we know when the Christ is lifted up, mm. all are drawn to Him. Amen. And so we ask that all that we say and do in this hour would lift up the Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, our memory verse this week is from Mark seven fifteen. And it says, There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, these are the things that defile a man. Mm -hmm. mm, amen. Yes. So this week, we are going to study specifically chapter 7 of Mark and a portion of chapter 8. And we're going to enter into one of these experiences of Jesus that he had to do or deal with those individuals in the time of Christ who felt they had really understood what it meant to be, uh, a, a, you know, a, a true follower of God. And they had really taken to heart the concept of trying as best as they could or, or as much effort as they could to put into outward works, into being able to truly show devotion, a commitment to the Jewish uh, religion, of course, to, to, to the God, to the temple, etc. So we're going to see what happened in this interaction with Christ, and we're going to dive right into chapter 7. And I'm going to ask maybe, Diana, if you can read for us verses 1 through 13, to, so we can go over the story, because it's important to, for us to go over what happened, this exchange between Christ and the Pharisees and the leaders of, of the Jews that came to him. So read for us, and let's start there. Okay, so Mark 7, 1 to 13, mm -hmm. it says, Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, 
Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. He said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corban, that is a gift to God, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down and many such things you do. Amen. Yes. Thank you. So here we have the story, mm -hmm. um, and you know, and Diana, we have the story of Christ getting or being approached by the Pharisees and they indirectly uh, caused Christ to, or they wanted Christ to sort of be accused of breaking the law, but they didn't go directly to Christ. He mm -hmm. basically, they basically went towards and say, you know, your disciples, your followers, mm -hmm. they don't really follow the rules of the, you know, of the, of the leaders. They don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, were they really speaking of hygiene here? Were they speaking of not washing your hands before you eat? What was really that they were implying by this washing? Well, you know, this, this was not a hygienic exercise mm -hmm. that they're speaking of. Uh, because it says the, scribe, the Pharisees and some of the scribes. And, and so the Pharisees were religious leaders, but their, their calling card was their meticulous keeping of the law, the, the point by point. Um, and the scribes were charged with the responsibility, and this is important, to teach the people the law. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, they had approached uh, Jesus regarding his disciples because they had a tradition that uh, that a person could be defiled mm -hmm. if they ingested something unclean. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is then, what is unclean? And that uncleanness had to do often with things that were handled or, or, or a person coming in contact with something that would be considered uh, a, 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 an impure or defiling element, mm -hmm. like... Uh, unclean meat, meat that was offered to an idol, or a Gentile, or something that a Gentile had handled mm -hmm. uh, before one could ingest those, those substances that, that fell in those categories, not unclean meats, but things that were touched by Gentiles that were unclean, one would need to go through a ritual of cleansing himself from defilement before he could eat, because if he ate that which, uh, which had been touched by something unclean, mm -hmm. then he became defiled himself. And you know, it's, it's interesting you mentioned there that it was these ceremonial rituals that they would do to, to clean themselves or to purify themselves or purify the elements that they were trying to ingest uh, so that they would not be defiled. But this was not actually found in the law of God. Yeah. It was not actually an indication of God. They had actually added mm -hmm. all these certain rabbinical laws that would allow them to be, in a sense, in the mind of the people and to the, those that were watching, make them feel that they were holier or even better for doing these elements of, of yeah. mm -hmm. cleansing. And Christ, a uh, spirit of prophecy, mentions that when from childhood, he says there, and I will read this from the Star of Ages, page 84, says, For from childhood, Jesus acted independently of the rabbinical laws. He says, The scriptures of the Old Testament were his constant study, and the words, Thus said the Lord, were ever upon his lips. You see, he says then, following saying, As the condition of the people began to open his, to his mind, he saw that the requirements of society and the requirements of God were in constant collision. Mm -hmm. Men were departing from the word of God and exalting theories 
of their own invention. They were observing traditional rites that possess no virtue. Their service was a mere round of ceremonies. The sacred truths it was designed to teach were hidden from the worshipers. He saw that in their faithless service, they found no peace. They did not know the freedom of spirit that would come to them by serving God in truth. So Christ from childhood, he realized that the rabbinical laws, these extra things that they would be given or adding to the people in the teachings were actually hiding the plain truth of the word of God, the plain mm -hmm. truth of the law of God. And so they created these laws that were so many that in a lifetime of an individual, they could not learn them all. I mean, there were so many laws that they had. I mean, ways of how you were to eat in the condition of, I mean, type of clothing, type of color, type of length, etc. I mean, everything that you can think of, there was laws about that. This was the way that the enemy had entered into the minds of the Jewish nation to hinder or hide from their view what really God what required. And this is why Christ mentions that beautiful quote from Isaiah. He says, the problem you have is that you are, you know, in vain worshiping me because you are teaching the doctrines and commandments of men. So let me ask you today, do we have a similar approach in Christianity or we don't? What do you think about this? Diana, do I, we have I think that? that we can become that way about certain things, yeah. Well, I mean, isn't like it... Like, a, okay, order of the church service or yeah. um, what type of food we eat or different things like that. Absolutely. I mean, even and, and even if we actually think about this, you know, today, the tradition of the church, the tradition of, um, of, of for example, what they call the fathers of the church, uh, has created a lot of new ways in which people in mainstream Christianity follow this same thought. You know, let's worship on Sunday, for example. That is not a biblical instance. That's not in the law of God. It's a tradition, man-made tradition. It's something that was given, uh, not in the word, not given by Christ, not even by the disciples or anyone, but by man-made. That's one example where a lot of individuals today, I mean, mainstream Christianity is, is, is right up in the same concept. You know, they worship on Sunday because they feel that tradition in this sense is over the Bible. And so now, as you mentioned, now in our church, within our ranks, sometimes we can do the same thing. We can start putting the theory or the tradition or a man-made concept that has no virtue in itself and say, you got to do this. To that, you know, so you are a proof of God or you are, you know, a true Christian, a true Adventist. And this is where we have to be very careful. And this is what something that I think is affecting or has affected perhaps a large portion of our own church members. Well, in, in, in this, Jesus is very specific. Since, since the scribes were, their job was to teach the people the law, mm -hmm. but they were teaching them. So he, he specifically mentions Corbin. You know, this, this is a rabbinical construct. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this, is, this is not something that, that is found in, in what Moses was instructed to give the people. Uh, and so this, this is an addition to that, and, uh, and, but it is, it is taught in place of the law of God, which says, honor your father and your mother. Mm -hmm. uh, which means as long as they're living, you honor them. And if honoring is, is, is supporting them uh, in, their, in their elder years, uh, when they no longer are producing income theirself, themselves, then that is honoring your father and your mother. But here, there's a caveat that's being taught mm -hmm. that is not scriptural. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet the scribes are teaching that, and it's taught as if it were scriptural. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Jesus is saying, you know, you say you're worshiping me, you know, but it's just your mouth right. because the worship is not coming from your heart. You have mm -hmm. ulterior motives and the ulterior motives are so that you don't have to spend your money on your elderly parents. You got it for another reason. And 
that is the real defilement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not that you're able to hold it on to it for holy purposes. You're you are defiling. You are being defiled because you're not following my instructions. You know, Melvin, that's a very interesting point. I mean, from this lesson, Christ specifically speaks of this rule or this law they had, rabbinical law, by, by as you mentioned that people could say, oh, I have saved, or this has been dedicated to God, I will not help my parents. Contrary to the scriptures that you are to honor your parents and take care of them, mm -hmm. you know? And we have to be careful not to put institutions, because they would say this is for the temple, I have saved it for the Corban, that's why yeah. for the temple. And they could use it however they want to, exactly. as long as like when they die, it goes to the temple. Exactly, right. so it was, it was crazy. Yeah. But we have to be careful not to do the same and put institutions uh, above our requirements to the law of God or our duty to, towards men and towards the Lord. Mm -hmm. And this is something that you know, Christ mentions as an example of the probably thousands of experiences or incidents that they were breaking the commands of God by following the tradition. So then Christ makes a point, and we're going to emphasize this part, where we can actually go into what defiles a man. And uh, this is, oh, before we go. Before, I, I, just, yes. I just want to read this because there is a certain level of awareness Mm -hmm. in the, the Pharisee and scribe group. In, in, in verse 5 uh, of chapter 7, oh. it says, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but <laughs> eat with their unwashed hands? See, it, it, it wasn't be according to the law of God. <laughs> they understood it was a tradition of, of the elders, something passed down that was not recorded as a, a law. And, and you know, Melvin, you, thank you for bringing that comment. Because mm -hmm. I, I forgot about making this point that is very important. I think, the, praise the Lord, that you are brought this comment. Because it really points out that we are going to face, in a certain way, similar incidents where people are going to pressure us to follow traditions and customs or culture that is what is culturally you know, implied or proved. And they were actually saying, hey, the culture, the customs, the society today says you are to follow the traditions of the rabbis, of, of cleansing your hands, all these things. And they are making the point like, look, everybody does it. You know, this is tradition of, of the elders. We got to do that. Today, we have the same problem. We are facing pressure, you know, increasingly ever more to follow or to give in to what the world or to what our country or city or you know or government implies us is good for us to accept to embrace. It's like people want our church to be a safe space where everybody can feel and act and I display this experiment peace in or, or 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 safety in what they want to hold on to. But the truth of the matter is that a church is never to be a safe space in the conditions of the world is a safe space in the truth of the word of God, where people come to learn and to give up their, these things that are contrary to God. And this is what truly we are to uh, remember ourselves, you know, that like, but like we read from Spirit Prophecy, the, con the requirements of society and the requirements of God are in constant collision. Mm -hmm. They're in a collision course. What society says is right, the Bible says is wrong. Remember that at the end of the days will be what they call evil, good, and good, evil. Mm -hmm. And we are facing this today. And we have to be very careful that we are not embraced by this concept in our own experience, in our own family society. So with that in mind, let's see what the Lord says really defiles a man. Uh, we can actually read that. Uh, we find this in Mark 7 verses 14 through 19, and mm -hmm. I'll ask Diana to read for us this passage. Okay, verses 14 and 19. Through 19. Okay. When he had called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him. But the things which come out of him, these, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? 
Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. Hmm. All right, so what is this, you know, telling you, teaching you? What is this expression, this, this you know, dialogue that Christ has with the people and then with his disciples? What is he actually telling us? Well, you know, first of all, um, I, think, I think we have to read farther down to get a clear understanding because a lot of people jump on this and say, you see, we can eat whatever we want. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, okay. so I think we have to read another, a couple more verses. So in verse 20, he said, what comes out of a man, mm -hmm. that what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. From within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, lewdness and evil and the and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile a man. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th this is not about food. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's the first thing. Because food is not a tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about the traditions of the elders. The, the classifications of clean and unclean food uh, are written in the law. Mm -hmm. So th this goes on, you know, to say that, you know, it's purifying all foods. Well, it, when it talks about defilement of food, it's not talking about the classification of clean and unclean meats. Uh, that, that, that's the point, you know, that, that, that's being made here. Uh, it's what comes out of a man and not what enters him. Uh, so if, if, a, if a Gentile happens, to touch something before you eat it, it does not defile you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Melvin. And it's, it's very important that you mentioned how the issues from verse 20 to 23, Christ you know, specifies what really he's concerned with. He's concerned with the things that defile the man which come from the heart, you know, theft, fornication, murders, all these things. And, and it's really what he intends for us to be freed from. The Spirit of Prophecy says that Christ desires nothing so much as to redeem his, her his heritage from the dominion of Satan. And to be delivered from the dominion of Satan, he wants us to be able to receive the power that cleanses us from within and then without. So this is important that we keep in mind that, you know, Christ has the desire to remove the filthiness of our hearts give us a new heart, a newness of experience, a newness of spirit, so that we can have this clean heart and not just a clean exterior, clean hands, but a clean heart. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, with this concept, we can move into the next part of the lesson, so we can move along. We have this experience, this story that Christ has when he leaves that area and decides to go into a region that's far away. And let take us, Diana, there to that story that is found in Mark 7, 24 to 30. There's only six verses there, but what lessons can we find in this story? Read for us the lesson or the okay. story, rather. It says, From there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For, for this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. Hmm. Notice this story. This is an amazing story. You know, one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible, in, in a way, is really the verse that we have there, verse 24. It says that when he got to Tyre and Sidon and he entered into a house, he, Jesus, you know, did not want anyone to know that he was there. But notice what it says, that there, but he could not be hid. In other words, Christ 
he wanted to remain, I guess, have a little bit of time, a little bit of time, you know, out of the spotlight. But the fact is that his presence could not be hid from, from the locals, from those that are around mm -hmm. him. And it's so important to know that, you know, we can have that same assurance. We can go to the Lord and he's not hid from us. He's not trying to hide himself. He might just, you know, want us to exercise a little bit more faith. We might not see him today, but we can have the same assurance that he is not hiding from us. And when you feel that he might not be there or near, he's actually there. You just need to have that faith. And this, to me, this verse in a way shows you that this woman heard about Christ coming. She heard that he had traveled thus, you know, so far. I don't know how he, she found out, but the fact is that news traveled. She went to seek the Lord. But now, Melvin, tell us a little bit about the story. What speaks this to you, you know? Okay. What I find interesting is the flow. Mm -hmm. So we have the story back a few chapters about Jesus going, crossing over into the gatherings, the Gentile territory. Yeah. The and, and dealing with uncleanness. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because, you know, he deals with the man who has the unclean spirit. Uh, he's among the tombs, among the dead. He's cutting himself and bleeding. All these unclean things. The pigs. The, you know, the, all this uncleanness. And then, you know, he comes back uh, to the other side uh, where he deals with uh, his own people. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and then he goes to Nazareth, you know, his own town. And, and, and there he's not heard because... He's, you know, this kid who grew up here. He's, he's, he's not seen as someone of importance. Mm -hmm. uh, they have preconditioned his, uh, his ministry, so to speak. Uh, and then he's in Jerusalem, and he runs into the scribes and the Pharisees who want to talk to him about th this eating with unwashed hands and being defiled. And, and so he's corrects their thinking about this defilement as not being an internal, mm -hmm. uh, as being an internal thing and not an external thing. And what does he do next? He goes to Tyre. He goes to, the, uh, to, to, to Tyre territory. and Sidon. Yeah. He goes to the unclean territory again yes. where, he de <laughs> where he deals with an unclean woman. You know, she, she's a Syrophoenician. Uh, she's not one of the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet he demonstrates in the story that just because she is not of Israel, she is not outside of the pale of salvation. Hmm. She's not outside of the pale of his help and assistance. Um, and so, uh, of course, you know, the, 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 worry, the way he approaches her is, is, or she approaches him, but the way he responds uh, is certainly interesting uh, because uh, he, he basically tells her that, you know, the bread shouldn't be given to the dogs. So he's basically calling her a dog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, for his disciples, that, that would have registered fine with them. Mm -hmm. you know, they because, were actually thinking that was good. You yeah, know, yeah. Let her know. Yeah. And so, uh, but her response mm. is where the story turns mm -hmm. because she says in verse 28 yes lord even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumb mm -hmm. so she doesn't have an issue you know uh you know that 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 he is sent to the house of israel she's just saying but i'm sure you have something for us too yeah you know and his and and he says uh, go your way <laughs> you know, go your way. It's it's happened. It's done deal. Uh, you know, it's something about this story that you are just mentioning. She's told she is, in a sense, a dog, right? Mm -hmm. Now, how many of us would be offended by those words? Would you be offended? Would you take it like, wow, I can't believe, you know, mm -hmm. this is individual who, you know, I come to ask for help and look what he says. I think that even though she's obviously not offended, she actually takes hold of that faith and that conviction that she has someone before him, before her, who could help her with her issue with her daughter. 
she actually, you know, replies with that, that faith and says, look, you're true, Lord, but you know what? Even the dogs can eat of the tables, you know, master tables and the crumbs. So she embraces that as a possibility for her to give Christ the assurance that she has faith, his mercy can extend to her. But in many cases, people get offended. And sometimes I think that, you know, just like, like the, the example of Christ later on in his ministry, when he talked about how he was the bread of heaven and he was, you know, the, the true water of life, many disciples did not want to hear that anymore. You know, they were like, this is not, you know, something good to, to hear. They were offended by his words. And so I think that it's also important that we are not, we don't, we don't become super sensitive to what the Word of God tells us. Sometimes the Word of God might tell you something that you're not truly happy with, you know, may, may point out something in your life that, you know, that you need to recognize, I'm selfish. I have to give up, you know, this thought that I'm good of myself, where I have so many degrees and, you know, letters behind my name, but truly that's not important to the Lord. So maybe some things in the gospel may offend us if we are selfish, if we are, you know, with our ego there. But Christ, when he speaks words that are, might be a little bit of a rebuke, are words to encourage us to seek even farther and to continue to hold on to him. So this is an example, I believe, of one example of someone who, instead of looking into the words as a way to say, oh, he doesn't want to accept me, well, you know, too bad, she actually embraces and says, you know what, Lord, True, what you say is true. It's not good to give the bread to the, to the dogs, but you know, the dogs do eat from the master's tables and they eat the crumbs. And it sort of shows you that I believe also the words of Christ had in some way helped her to develop that confidence that Christ was not necessarily shutting her down, but she just, he was trying to sort of test and prove how much of a faith she had mm -hmm. with his disciples. Who the disciples thought, oh yeah, she's not worthy to receive the blessings of God because she's not a Jew, she's a Gentile, she's a, and he, she's a heathen, she's an unclean individual. Yes. But Christ showed, no, my mercy extends to everyone. You know, you just need to make sure that you keep pressing on and not to give up based on just your, you know, first impression, a sense of, of, of feelings in a way. Any thoughts about this? Well, it might seem like Jesus was responding in a harsh way, but he was responding in the typical way that Edgy would have responded back then and the way that the disciples would have responded. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was a test for the woman and to test her faith and see how much her faith she had and also a lesson and a test for the disciples as well. And then he shows what true compassion he really did have for the Gentiles, that he really did love them and care about them. Yeah. You know, de de again, desperate times call for desperate, desperate measures. measures, you know, and this woman has a child. Just Jairus had a daughter who was sick and dying. Mm -hmm. This woman has a daughter who was demon possessed. Mm -hmm. And there was, this woman saw hope mm -hmm. for deliverance for her daughter. And she would have gone to the dirt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she, would, she would have gone down to the mat, as they say, for her daughter. And she did. Uh, and Jesus tells a story about faith uh, of the woman who goes, who goes before the unjust judge. Mm -hmm. you know, who does not regard man or God. And, and, and she keeps going and going and going until the judge answers her prayer. And, and, and this woman is the reality mm -hmm. of, of that story. Yes. Uh, she sees that he can help and she is going to be persistent until her request is answered. Amen. And she demonstrates her faith in being persistent. Praise the Lord. And you know, this spirit of prophecy mentions this about her. It says, the answer, this answer of Christ would have utterly discouraged a less earnest seeker. But the woman saw that her opportunity had come. Beneath the apparent refusal of Jesus, she saw a compassion that he could not hide. So, you see, she, she did not waver in her faith by the apparent refusal. She actually saw the compassion of Christ, even though she was, he was saying that yeah. to her, she saw that she was, he, had, he, he was moved to compassion towards her. And so then she mentions that she begs, for, she begs for the crumbs that fall from the master's table. If she may have, have the privilege of a dog, she's willing to be regarded as a dog. Yes. 
She had no national or religious prejudice or pride to influence her course, and she immediately acknowledged Jesus as the Redeemer and as being able to do all that she asked of him. So that is why she's such a movement of faith. Yeah. You know, she said, you know what, Lord? It's okay. I can be called dog at your table. I'm happy because I'm receiving the crumbs of your mercy. Now, this is in contrast. See, this is interesting. And I love the way these things yeah. are laid out. This is in contrast to back at home in Nazareth. See, this mm. woman says, yeah. you have what I need. Yes. I need to get it from you. The people back in Nazareth said, who is this? Yeah, who is this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so he can't do many things there in, in his hometown mm -hmm. because they don't, have, they don't have the faith. They don't have faith that he can. They're caught up on who he is. And they are the chosen. They, they are the ones who should be eating at the table, but they are going hungry mm. Mm. because they don't believe him. And this is the thing, you know, how many times maybe the Lord has placed us in positions of trial and test to see what is our response when we are experiencing difficulty, when we're experiencing a, a, a moment of need. Do we respond to the trial with, that same faith as this woman did. You know, we say, oh, you know, God, you haven't abandoned me. I can trust that you are with me. This is important. Uh, Spirit of Prophecy mentions that when her faith has been made manifest, because she responded to him, hey, mm -hmm. I know, Lord, but the dogs can receive the, the crumbs from the master's table. The Lord said to her, right? Look at the answer to him, to her by the Christ in verse 29. For this saying, for what you said, right. go thy way. Right. The devil is gone out of you know, your daughter. Right. So it's sort of like saying, because you have developed and showed faith in responding to the trial and to this apparent rejection, and you have showed that you are willing to continue and to press on, according to your saying, the child is gone. I mean, the child is free from the demon. Yeah. So what a blessing. I think that we are to have encouragement that Christ's heart does manifest compassion, even when our trials may seem as though he may be not answering to, our, to what we think he should do. Yeah. You know, but God is there and he's willing to give us an, a, an opportunity to develop more faith and to encourage us in that experience. I, I want to put a plug in for the mother. Praise <laughs> the Lord, brother. <laughs> Amen because to that. Many, many of us are parents. Yes. And, and, and one of the things that, you know, we, 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 we have our children and we love our children and we would do anything for our children. Mm -hmm. But often, uh, you know, our children uh, go in a way that is contrary. Mm. And, and, and this woman's daughter is demon possessed. And we know, we know from other stories in scripture that the man playing amongst the tomb, he stayed up all night cutting and screaming and mm -hmm. yet, and, and we know about the man who brought his son to Jesus, the, the disciples, and he says sometimes he throws him into the water, the demons throw him into the fire. Yeah. Uh, and we, we see our children struggle, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it breaks our heart. But you know, even though they, they appear uh, to be totally overtaken mm. by demonic forces, there is deliverance. Amen. There's hope for them. There's Amen. hope for deliverance. As long as there's breath, there's hope because Jesus is the answer for every problem that we face in life. And this is important, you know, to have that. We have to ask the Lord to help us to grow in faith. Yes. We may not see everything, you know, in our favor. We may not see the, the, the performance of a miracle because the woman had to believe that the yes. word of God, the word of Christ meant that her daughter was going to be freed. She just had to trust him. And this is the thing. Sometimes we have to trust and ask the Lord to help us to have that faith. Even though it might be as tiny as a master seed, we need to have that faith. We need to ask God, help me to grow in faith so that I may receive the, the blessing of, of, of trusting your word mm -hmm. in spite of what I may per perceive, you know, in our experience. So with that said, let's continue with the next part of the lesson. In Wednesday, we're going to go to the experience or a story that is very peculiar and unique. <laughs> it's one of the, these unique examples of God's and uh, Christ's power in healing someone, but it's a healing that is very unique and 
It's uh, one of those healings that really kind of break the mold of Christ. Usually Christ, you know, says the word, like in the case of the woman in, in, um, in the Syrophoenician women, you know, he just said, your daughter is freed. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of the woman by the, that came by Christ and touched his robe, yes. she touched him. But in this particular case, we're going to see something that Christ does differently. So, Diana, if you can read for us uh, verses 31 through 37 from Mark 7, and let's listen to the story and what happens here in this miracle. Okay, starting in verse 31, it says, Again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Immediately his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one. But the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed mm. it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Wow. Tell me, Diana, what about this story brings, you know, talk, call your attention, this story specifically? What, what points do you feel that, or what part of the experience you see it as, as unique, as interesting to you? It's interesting the way that he heals him, mm -hmm. that he's putting his fingers in his ears and touching his tongue. And I don't know, I think part of it is showing the personal touch of God mm -hmm. is very healing. Physical touch can be very healing um, and showing that he cared about him. He wasn't worried about the fact that he was an outcast and he was a Gentile and touching him, he could be unclean. He wasn't concerned about that. He's saying, I love you. I care about you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I thought that was interesting. Wow. Have you ever met somebody that has that problem with not able to speak? Or, or hear. Yeah, and often in in when you deal in, in issues of audiology, people who can't hear often have unusual speech patterns mm -hmm. because they, you know children hear and they replicate what they hear. Right. So if a person can't hear or if their if their hearing is impaired, often what they replicate in speech will also be impaired. Um, and so uh, it it goes to the connection. Of, of the total human. And, and so Jesus in his healing is healing the whole person. Uh, and as you pointed out, uh, Deanna, it, it talks about his intimacy. And, and it, at, the, at the end where it says he, he's done all things well in verse 37, that kind of takes us back to the creation story mm -hmm. where every day it was good, it was good, it was good, it was very good. And the last day of creation, he does something very intimate. He, he forms man from the dust of the ground, mm -hmm. and he breathes into his nostrils. This is like CPR. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is an intimate act. Mm -hmm. He breathes into his nostrils, and man comes alive. And here, it, this is a, a recreative act that he performs on this man and restores him to what he should have been at birth, but, mm -hmm. you know, in a normal sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's what you mentioned is something particular. This story says that he takes the men aside. You know, he says that he, he kind of departed from the norm. He actually, I, I don't know if necessarily that meant that he took him privately. Probably he meant that mm -hmm. he took him privately. And he does this, as you mentioned, Diana, this concept of touching the man, both in his ears and his mouth and speaks to him in ways that, you know, he says, Fatha, which means be opened. And this experience of Christ touching the man, giving him the healing, giving him that touch that you well mentioned, sort of portrays the personal aspect of Christ. When someone in, it's, is needing the Lord, he can, in spite of his many things. He can set time aside and be with you one-on-one. -on -one. He can actually be a, a, a personal friend that you need, and he will have time for you. That's a promise also we see in the experience, that he has time for individuals who need that personal touch aside. Now, just to, I, I found something interesting from Spirit Prophets as well in regards to this healing. 
she says this, uh, Jesus did not, according to his custom, restore the man by a word only. Mm -hmm. Taking him apart from the multitude, he put his fingers in his ears and touched his tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed a thought of the ears that would not be open to the yes. truth. Yes. The tongues that refused yeah. to acknowledge the Redeemer. Mm -hmm. In other words, he even felt, you know, using the example of this man, Christ felt, you know, sadness to think, you know, there are many who could hear the truth, they don't want to hear. Yes. And the many that could speak the truth or praise the Lord will not. So in, in a sense, his desire for him to be healed is a desire that he has for many people mm -hmm. to have their ears open and their mouths open to hear the truth and, pre and, and preach the truth and praise the Lord. Yes. But unfortunately, many today, like Christ, you know, foresaw, you know, would reject his words, would reject his, uh, you know, his invitation, would not listen to Christ anymore, yes. you know. And this is yeah. sadness, you know, that, that I think in a sense filled his heart. But using this example, he preached or he healed this man and even asked him not to share. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> he, you know, it's, what's interesting, you know, uh -huh. in, 30, in verse 31, you know, he's, he, he's, he's departing Sire and, uh, Tyre and Sidon and comes through the midst of the region of the Decapolis. Mm -hmm. So he's still in Gentile territory, yeah. you know. And, after, and, and they bring to him this man, and, and, and he heals this man. He has this experience, and he tells him, you know, just you know, let this be on the down low. Just keep this quiet. It, but they cannot. <laughs> they cannot. They have to speak of the goodness of God. You know, and his, his fame spreads out even more. But in his hometown, he can't get anybody yeah. <laughs> to testify, he can't get in. He, he, he can't get anybody to say up, stand up, and say he, Jesus is Lord. <laughs> but outside of his territory, people mm -hmm. are raving. Could it be possible that this sort of indicates that in these last days, many who are not with the knowledge of the truth, who have not been raised in the knowledge of the truth, will be, you know, be the ones like the ones that don't hear anymore and they don't really preach the truth anymore and they are passed over to those who are maybe in the world and are, are unclean, maybe they don't know the truth, but when they receive that healing or that gospel, they will go ahead and preach more than, than us who are in the faith? I mean, could that be the case? Well, I, 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 I see that well within the realm of possibility and reality, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that those who have it's 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 like the parable of of the workers mm -hmm. you know those who were hired all day to work and those yeah. who came at the at the last hour to work they all got the same reward but the ones who who had worked all day did not perceive the privilege mm -hmm. that they had to yeah. work side by side with the lord for the whole time they were in his field Mm -hmm. Say so that you know they saw themselves as hired servants, and so they were in it for the money, <laughs> for you know whatever. But of those who came at the end, yeah. were glad to receive the reward. Mm -hmm. And so there are those who will learn of the love of Christ at the eleventh hour, and they will be so glad. Amen. It happens now when we bring people to church; they're mm -hmm. so happy. Mm -hmm. to be there and the saints want to know what they're so happy about <laughs> and that's the thing mel we are seeing this today yes mm -hmm. that people who are in the world who have been you know in the chains of the enemy for many years are embracing the truth and they are truly living to the truth they receive i mean it is i just shared this brief testimony of a young man who wrote here to the ministry not too long ago about how he had just come you know he was in the world, he was in deep in spiritualism, deep in this, uh, I don't know, uh, experience of, of the enemy. And yet when he came to the truth, he believed the truth and he believed the, the concepts and he embraced many of the practices that the Bible teaches of. And he was surprised when he joined that in this church. He said, I am surprised that many who have been years in the faith, they don't really believe or preach this truth anymore. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't see the dangers. They don't want to, mm -hmm. you know, change their lives and he was just saying i'm so thankful for the ministry that you know you are teaching the truth and preaching preaching the, me the messages that i don't hear in the church and he's like i'm a new adventist and i want to hear more about this so it's definitely the case today 
And just to finish up the story, because mm. the time is going into, we are finishing time, we, yes. we sort of go to the last uh, part of Thursday's lesson. And in Thursday's lesson, we have somewhat what comes full circle, what happens with the Pharisees, you know? Mm -hmm. We started with them in the beginning, how they were worried about the, 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 you know, the uncleanness and what defiles the, 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 the body more so, the external. And Christ now brings a little element, uh, gives a little parable of what happens with bad bread. Watch out for bad bread. Mm -hmm. uh, can you please, Diana, read for us briefly the, these verses that are found in verses 11 to 13 of Mark 8. Okay. It says, Then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign should be given to this generation. And he left them and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. And continue please to verse 15. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them saying, take heed, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Wow. So here, can you summarize? What is this, you know, what's he Christ saying? You know, he has to face the Pharisees again and then he tells them about how they seek an external sign that already had been, you know, given by many miracles in the past. They had seen the power of God. They could not deny that he was really someone who was above their authority, yet they still wanted to put this concept that they would not accept Christ unless he, he came to their customs, to their concepts. And so Christ says, you know what? No more signs are going to be given to you. But then he goes to the disciples and says, be, be careful of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Herod, Herodians. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about this, Mel. Well, when we, when we think about leaven, you know, it's, it's, it, you know when in baking, yes. you have a little yeast. It's just a little bit mm -hmm. put in a big bowl of dough. Yeah. But it, 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 it spreads through and it has impact mm. in, in the larger, you know, community. Yes. And, and, and so... This starts, you know, we, 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 we encountered these scribes and Pharisees, you know, initially who were having difficulty with Jesus because of, you know, defilement. And, exactly. And, and, you know, this, these are unscriptural things, but they, 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 because of their traditions, they have impacted the lives of people. Mm -hmm. And they have become, these, these things have become more important than the word itself. Mm -hmm. and, and here Jesus is saying, be careful about the leaven, the, the, the influence of the scribes and the Pharisees. You don't want to be corrupted mm -hmm. by them. Uh, keep your focus on the word of God, not, not, not on the tradition, mm. but on the word. That which I speak to you, it is life. You know, Jesus is the bread of life. Man mm -hmm. should not live by bread al al alone, but by every word Amen. that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so it's more important that we not just, that we not cling to tradition, but that we follow God as specified in his word. Deanna, what do you think, just as, uh, you know, it's, it's an example of 11 in today's experience society. What, what could be for you at leaven, you know, that is dangerous in, in the concept of, of, of this? What do you think would be a leaven? I think ideas of the world, um, politics, and mm. yeah. That's, so a, that's actually a big, <laughs> <laughs> it's a big, you I can think get caught true. up in different mindsets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's absolutely true. And this is the thing is the customs of the world are so much into our own experience. Many times we get caught up into politics, into, you know, what people think is right, what should you do with education, et cetera. And we forget that these things can corrupt and change, like the leaven changes the bread or the flour rather, and, and creates a bread and, and, and loads the whole thing. So these things can really grow and change our mindset or point. So we pray now that as you study this lesson that you were blessed, we pray that you will continue to study God's word and not to be sidetracked by the world and anything that the world offers, but that you may look into Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. May God bless you, and we look forward to having another study next week. Blessings to you. Mm -hmm.